Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am so pleased to see you as we close out this year. What better way to finish the year than to celebrate what God has done and his faithfulness and how his strength and his peace and his joy have sustained us. You know, for many of us, it's been a rough year, but God's been faithful. He was with us every step of the way. And, you know, when we think about the future, when we think about the uncertainties of 2024 and beyond, will God not still be faithful? He will be, won't he? Praise the Lord. I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to worship together. Uh, as you know, as you can see, probably, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper here shortly. And a couple of things I thought I'd mention to you real quick. Wednesday night, we will not be having any, uh, evening Bible study. Um, and uh, I think uh, that many of you have committed to help. Uh, we have some things that we would like to do to support uh, Monika's family uh, during that day. So uh, just so be, uh, be aware. Tuesday night, also, uh, we're going to be taking some things down and getting ready to get things uh, uh, set up and decorated for uh, what comes after Christmas and the Advent season. Uh, so if you'd like to help Tuesday evening, that would be great. And then next Saturday, uh, two things. Uh, Saturday morning at 7, Men's Fellowship will be gathering for donuts and coffee and prayer. And uh, after that, uh, we are having a free wood, firewood giveaway, and uh, we're looking forward to being able to meet many families. And we have a lot of families who come through and receive that and tell us what a blessing it is and how they appreciate what God has done in providing it for them. And uh, uh, so... Uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. I think we're about halfway. Was it? What is it? Five hundred forty-five. We're not even quite halfway. So Lottie Moon, if you would like to make a gift toward that, that supports international missions, and uh, it gives uh, our church an opportunity to participate in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. And so, if you'd like to do that, you can just put it in the offering box there. Just mark it though. There's a special envelope if you would like to do that, uh, and you can give to that. So. I feel like there are always announcements that I'm probably missing. Yes, Ms. Lee. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is the end of the year, and uh, if you want your contribution found from what you give this past year, just sign this so I know who to make the paper out. If you don't want it, don't sign it. So. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Lee. In your bulletin, you'll find a uh, through the Bible reading program, and uh, for every, if you read the Bible five days, you follow this program, you'll actually have read the whole Bible by the end of 2024. And uh, so we put that in there for your use. It's a great tool. Many folks have used it, and uh, and attest to the fact that it's a, it's just an effective way to read through the Bible. Uh, also, one other thing, if you as I mentioned, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. This is the, the time of the month where we put in the prayer guide for uh, January. Uh, so uh, that is every day an opportunity to pray for a specific need. Uh, somewhere as missionaries are sharing the gospel of Jesus and, and looking for opportunities to, to, to share with more people, especially unreached people groups, here's an opportunity for you to participate. Maybe you can't go. And uh, if you can give, great. But if you can't even give, then you can certainly still pray. As a child of God, you have access to the throne of God. And you can prevail upon your Heavenly Father to work in the needs of people around the world. So I hope that you'll remember that our, the arm of our God is not short. And even as you pray here, that because of your prayers here, God is reaching people around the world. Isn't that amazing? God has no limit to where he can reach. And so I hope that you'll... <coughs> Take advantage of that and let that be kind of a guide and as a, as a tool for you uh, to pray through. Uh, do we have any other announcements that we need to mention? Okay. Well, I want everyone to feel welcome here today. Not because I'm here, and it's not really important that I'm here so much as it is that you're here and that God is here. That means that God has something for you today, something to say to you, and, and he's working in your heart that if you'll listen, that he'll bring to you what you need most. And I, I can tell you that what you need most from God isn't what he can do for you out there somewhere, but what he can do in you as he brings to you the wonderful promise of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for you, took your place so that your sin could be forgiven, that you could be cleansed and be, be made a child of God. 
And you know, with that comes that hope of eternity. And every Sunday when we gather together, we always want to uphold the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, because it's the only way, it's the only way to heaven. So, uh, I hope that uh, as we uh, read our scripture, as we pray, as we sing, that you remember that the audience is who? God. And so, as you sing, as you pray, let those, let those prayers, let those songs be aimed at Him. And because of Jesus, you know you have the promise that your prayers are heard by Him. Would you stand with me as we prepare uh, for our worship? I'm going to open us in prayer, and then we'll move into our scripture reading. Let's pray together. Father God, we just bless your name, and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your faithfulness, Lord. As we close up, Lord, this Christmas season, Lord, it's really just the beginning. Every day, Lord, as we reflect, Lord, no matter what time of year it is, that Jesus came, that he was born, that he lived among us, that he lived a sinless life, Lord, and that he died in our place, but that he also rose from the dead. Lord, when we consider the, the, the enormous, wonderful news of Jesus coming, Lord, our hearts can barely take it in. So, Lord, we want today to look to you, to praise you, to exalt you, Lord, to know you more deeply, Lord, and to live lives that are more pleasing and fruitful for you. Lord, we pray that as we've come today with heavy hearts or happy hearts, whatever, Lord, that will uh, allow you, Lord, access to us. And that whatever reason, Lord, we might find to hold back from you, Lord, that today you would heal us of that. You would help us to trust you, to obey you, to let ourselves go, Lord, to you into your loving hands, knowing that those perfect, loving, nail-scarred hands that hold us forever. We praise you. We give you the glory, Lord. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would, read with me Psalm 40, verses 11 through 16. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see you. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. But be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make peace to help me. But all, may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord.
persevere them to the end, and Lord, you will raise them up at the last day. Lord, we want to thank you so much for every promise that you've given to us in your scriptures. Lord, I just pray that this service will be edifying to the believer, convicting to the non-believer, and Lord, ultimately glorifying to you and you alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My, my heart's desire is for us to come to a place where we're seeing Jesus, that we're looking at Jesus, we're hearing Jesus. If you believe that God's Word is God's Word, if you believe the Bible is spoken from Him, then when we turn the pages and we encounter Jesus, then we're having an encounter with God. We're actually... We're always in his presence in one sense, but in the in the sense that we're that, that there's an immediacy that he's right here. When you open that Bible, when you believe that it is his word, when you know that it is, you're encountering him. 
And when he speaks, when he speaks, those words that he speaks to you, they're precious. You know, we have a lot of things we pursue in life. We have a lot of things we chase after. We, we chase them as if they are the things that can make us happy. That they are the things that can make us whole. But in the end, they can't. Only God's word, his promises to you can do that. And Jesus, of course, is the word made flesh. And so when we hear from Jesus, when we see him working in the world, when we, when we read these words, when we see those words as we read them together, when we hear those words, we're encountering Jesus. And he's just as, li as alive as he was in those moments when he spoke to the disciples. So when he speaks to them, I hope that you and I hope that I will always find ourselves in the midst so that as he speaks to them, we know also that he's speaking to us. Encountering him. You know, you've had a full year, right? This is the last day of the year. We're wrapping it up, correct? You can look back at this past year and you can think a lot of thoughts about it, whether it was good or bad or a combination of things. But in the end, God was there all along. In the end, he had things there for you. And among those things, not just easy roads and comforts and pleasures, of course, although I hope that there were some of those things at least, but even those hard moments, the presence of God, Knowing that he was there when your heart hurt. Knowing that he was there when you were uncertain, you felt anxious. And he knew what you were feeling. He knows what lies before you. He knows what's in 2024. He knows already what's coming this week. <coughs> and he's prepared for you a provision, a strength, a help to carry you, to heal. <coughs> Sometimes in the Christian experience, we can get a little trite and cliche. We can say the Christian words that we're supposed to say. And sometimes when we say them, of course, when we say them in the hearing of someone who isn't quite there, you know, the words that we say seem empty. But I'll say this. I was thinking of Jesus as he encountered Mary and Martha at Bethany after Lazarus had passed. And how in their heartache, they wept. And how in his knowledge of their pain, his knowing of their pain, their sorrow, that Jesus wept too. So he knows. He understands. But he's here. And he overcomes. You know, this is the hope that we're singing about. This hope. This hope that we have in Jesus is a hope that transcends death. It goes beyond. And even death can't hold it down. It's an eternal hope. An everlasting hope. Jesus died, but he rose from the dead. Jesus died, but he ascended to heaven. Do you know what he does now? Until he returns, do you know what he does? The Bible tells us that he intercedes for us. He sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for his people. You know whose people are? If you're his, if you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you're one of those people. And he loves you. He carries you. He's faithful to you. Even when we stumble in our faithfulness, he never stumbles in his faithfulness. He's faithful. He remembers you belong to him. And he'll never let you go. Before we go into reading the scripture this morning, I'd like for us to just pray one more time and ask God to open our hearts, open our hearing, open our minds, so that as he speaks, we hear we perceive, we know that it's him, and we know how to respond. Because there is a response that you and I give him. Whether we respond the way we should isn't always the case, but there's always a response of some kind. And our prayer, as we pray, as we read, as we hear, as we contemplate how he's speaking, how he's leading, our prayer is that we respond with faith. That we respond with obedience, and we respond with worship. Because he's worthy. He is that good. He is that great. That even if everything's a mess, he's still good. Everything's a mess. He's still great. Everything's a mess. He's still there with us through it. 
making it mean something. Do you know your pain means something in the hand of God? Your sorrow, your sadness, your frustrations with people, with life, that job. Your suffering means something to your Heavenly Father. So let's pray. Father God, as we come to you again and as we prepare, Lord, to hear from you and to respond to you, Lord, help us, Lord, to receive what you have for us. Your words, their life, Lord, their, their healing, their encouragement, their conviction, their transformation, Lord. Your words, Lord, they're an anchor to us. When we feel like we're drifting across the ocean of life and the problems of this world seem like they're going to just sweep us away, Father. Your word, Father, holds us in place. It anchors us to, Lord, who you really are. You're a God who is greater than your creation. You are a God who holds it all together in your hand. And it is your word, O oh God, that can, continues, Lord, to sustain us, that, that keeps the sun, Lord, where it is, keeps our planet revolving around it, that keeps us alive and allows us each breath. And so, Father, we pray that as we read, as we hear, Lord, that, Lord, we would receive, that we take it in. We grab hold of what you have to say, Lord, and allow you, Lord, to plant it deeply within us so that your peace, your joy, Lord, your hope, Lord, would bear fruit, that it would spring up, Lord, and come to the fullness that you have for us, Lord. Our families, Lord, where they're hurting, you care, Lord. Let us, Lord, be where we need to be with you so that your grace, Lord, would flow through us. Our community, Father, it needs you. It needs your help. Where there is darkness, Lord, we know, Lord, that it is your light that dispels that darkness. It is your truth that pushes back the lies of Satan. We thank you, Lord, that you're faithful to us, that we have this chance, Lord, to partake of the bread of your word, and we may fellowship together in what it means to be a people redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and given a shared hope, that shared hope, Lord, of, e of eternal life with you. We praise you, Lord, that you're faithful, that you're good, and we thank you that you're here. We thank you for each soul here, Lord. Oh, Lord God, I pray that your hand would reach into their lives and encourage and strengthen and help and comfort, Lord, and support them in every need. And that you'd open their eyes to your presence today. And so we pray together, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was thinking about how we would wrap up this year, I was thinking about how, of course, it's natural at the end of the year to, be, to kind of take stock over the past year. To take stock of the things, the ups and the downs and the ins and the outs of everything that's happened of where we've gotten in life, because about a year ago, you were thinking about what 2023 would hold for you, were you not? You were thinking, is it going to be an easy year, a good year, a pleasant year? Am I going to grow? Am I going to get where I want to go and, in life and achieve those things and, and have those dreams fulfilled that I've been dreaming a while? You wondered that a year ago, just a year ago. And I'm sure that as the year passed, as the calendar pages turn, that some of the things you hoped for happened, probably not nearly as many as you'd wanted to see, but some of them, and that a lot of unexpected things developed too, that caught you off guard, that surprised you, whether in the world at large, the things that have gone on, and we, we hear about conflict, of course, in the Middle East with Hamas and Israel, we think about how the war with Ukraine and Russia continues and how it's still there and how things in our country go back and forth and how unsettling it can be. And then we think about our community. We think about people who struggled with addiction or struggled with some kind of loss, people who have hurt other people. We've, but not all bad. We hear about the prospect of possibly jobs coming into the area, and that's encouraging, right? We're not sure what it means yet, but it's encouraging. Sounds good. But a mixture of things. We take stock over the things that we hoped for and the things that weren't. One thing, though, I think 
we have to reflect on. If we're a Christian and we, and we consider our walk with God important, if we really do, if we really consider our walk with God to be something more than just that weekly routine, and that walk with God to be something more than we just sort of talk about in a, as I said before, in a cliche kind of way, but something that we really depend on, that someone we really trust in. Hopefully, as we look back over the past year, we look at whether or not we've matured any. We've grown any. Our roots are a little deeper. Maybe there's been some fruit, hopefully. Hopefully, that has been the case. Hopefully, as you look back, you can think of the ways that God has answered prayer and shown up and proven himself. Not that he has to prove anything, because he doesn't have to prove anything. But he has proven Whenever you're considering whether or not you're loved by God or whether God's lost control of his creation, remember that Jesus was born and that was the plan of God. That Jesus grew up, that was the plan of God, without sin, and that was the plan of God. That Jesus was betrayed, and that was the plan of God. That Jesus was crucified, and that was the plan of God. That he lay in the tomb. And that was the plan of God. But that he also rose from the dead. And that was the plan of God. Remember that the God who was in charge then is the God who's still in charge now. And he is not a God who can forget who belongs to him. You're his child. He doesn't forget that. He's not like I am. I forget things all the time. Diane's not in the room. And that's a good thing, because you could tell you all the ways I forget things. Would you go to the store, Tom, and get this? And I'll go to the store and get the thing she said not to get. I don't know if anybody else does that, but I forget things. But God doesn't. He doesn't forget. He doesn't change his mind. He's not fickle. Have you ever had a person make a promise to you and then just decide to not keep it? God isn't like that. God, when he makes a promise, keeps his promise. Isn't that reassuring? Isn't that encouraging? That the God who calls you, the God who makes promises to you, the God who signed the promise with the blood of his son, is the God who keeps his promise. Isn't that reassuring? And when we read these words, and we remember that the words he's speaking here are the words he wants us to hear, that as we read these words, as we look at how he spoke then about those who had placed their faith in him and become his children, how those promises are transmitted to them. And he knows. He planned it. It was his will that you hear of his love for you. So we take stock, right? We hope that we mature comes a point as we mature in Christ, or even as we become believers in the first place, when we realize the fruitlessness of our best efforts to measure up to God's perfect standard. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, the God who authored the Bible through these human instruments, the God who ordained that Jesus come, that Jesus died for us, the God who ordained that we hear that he also rose from the dead, that God who did that that he's perfect and holy, which is why it's necessary for the cross. You know that, but we can't emphasize it enough. What this means is that when I live life apart from that, when I try to make life make sense on my own, when I try to live up to some kind of standard other than God's, or when I try to live up even to his standard on my own, do you know how foolish and fruitless that is? Because I certainly can. God's perfect. I am not. It took a perfect sacrifice to cover my imperfection. A sinless lamb to cover my sinfulness. It's so fruitless to try to live life apart from him. And, and Christian, I, I remind you too that as we live day by day, how easy it is to get distracted to become diluted in our affections and then forget how desperately we need him every moment, every breath, and how we 
foolishly try to begin to handle life on our own. Do we not sometimes do that? I, have, I confess, I have done that. God pulls me in. I begin to get distracted. I wander, you know, maybe the world doesn't see it, but he knows. And he pulls me back in again. There's a fruitlessness, both morally and practically. Morally, I can't live up to a standard on my own, but practically, I can't make, life, make sense of life on my own. I don't know about you. Actually, yeah, I do. I do. I do know this about you, because that's who we are as humans. We can't live life in a way that makes any sense apart from Jesus, because you realize that you and I were created for him. So, if you will, I would like for you to turn to Luke chapter 22. Now, it's in Luke, of course, where one of some of our most common readings at the Christmas time take place. It's the beginning of Luke, usually, right? Where we learn about Jesus having been born in a stable, and we learn about the angels appearing to the shepherds and announcing his arrival, and how that they will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes or cloths, and lying in a manger as assigned to them. In Luke 22. In a sense, we're continuing the Christmas story. It may not seem like Christmas, but it is, because this is why it came. In Luke 22, verses 14 through 20, when the hour came, this is the night before he's betrayed, the night before he goes before the Sanhedrin council, falsely accused of so many terrible things, because they hate him. It's shortly before... He will be crucified. He knows this. When the hour came, Jesus reclined at table, verse 14, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he, had, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 19, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, verse 20, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So, you, you hear what he's saying here. He's talking to them about something new, is he not? He uses the expression a new covenant. You know what a covenant is. Covenant is a special, solemn, serious promise. Now, what is if this is the new covenant, then what is the old covenant? Well, I point you to Genesis 17, for example, where he makes originally that promise to Abraham. He makes a special promise, a covenant, and it's that covenant they refers to in Exodus chapter 19, which is a couple of chapters before the Ten Commandments are actually given. The commandments are a reflection of the covenant of man's responsibility, his side of the covenant, that covenant relationship. You know, when we look at marriage, we talk about the covenant of marriage. And, and I can't tell you how important it is to understand that marriage is not a business contract. It is a covenant. It is a special promise. It is an oath, if you will, a vow. Meaning that that you are giving yourself to the other person. And in this sense, this is what the Old Testament covenant was. God gave himself to Abraham and his descendants. And the covenant rode on two things, on what God would do, what God would, how God would be faithful, and then how the people of God would reflect their faithfulness to him, which they never could do. We could spend a lot of time, and we will throughout the year talk about it, I'm sure, we could spend a lot of time talking about how in their human nature, which is just like our human nature, we make promises to God or we try on our own to live up to God's standard and find that we cannot. Is that not so? And how history, as we read through the pages of the Old Testament, tells us how the people of God struggled with that covenant because they weren't perfect. And we can find fault with them and say, what a bunch of lunkheads, because they just wouldn't do what they were supposed to do. Why couldn't they get it through the thick skulls? But you realize, of course, that we struggle exactly the same way. Our hearts are bent. 
the Old Covenant, which rests on two parties fulfilling their end of the agreement, that relationship, fulfilling those promises that they've made to one another, we can't do. So, because we can't do it, Jesus came. You understand that it was because we could not live up to that standard on our own that we needed the Savior. We needed the sacrifice. We needed his intercession, his placing himself between the Holy Father uh, and, and us. Yes. In the end, taking on the anvil, if you will, of the judgment of God, God's wrath. God judged sin in Jesus so that you and I could be forgiven. God's not willy-nilly in his forgiveness. He can't forgive and at the same time forsake his holy standard. So what did he, what's he to do? Through Jesus, he fulfills the standard. The righteousness of Jesus is transferred to us as we receive it. Yeah, look at what he says. Take this, divide among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is for you, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying that this cup is poured out for you, the new covenant in my blood. So there's a shift. This new covenant is a shift from our keeping the covenant, which we couldn't do, to our receiving the covenant through Jesus Christ. Does that make sense to you? You and I don't. We don't, we, we have good intentions, right? We have good intentions. I'm going to live a holy life. I'm going to do what's right. And then we fudge here a little, and then we fudge there a little, and we slide a little bit there, and we're distracted over here, and we rationalize over there, and before we know it, we're way, way, way out in the fields. Wondering, how did we get here? We don't mean to wander away. Not usually. We don't mean to forsake God. Not usually. We just find that it sort of happens. We find that we didn't have the strength. Strength of will. The moral fiber, so to speak, to live up to that holy standard. And instead of washing his hands of us, instead of saying, I gave you a chance, I gave you a chance, I gave you a chance, I gave you a hundred chances, and you blew it every time. I'm done. He didn't do that, did he? He came and established a new covenant. One that we, while we cannot keep the covenant on our own, it's a covenant we receive through Jesus Christ. You know, here in a moment, as we observe the Lord's Supper together, as we eat that bread and remember the broken body of Jesus, as we drink that juice and we remember the blood of Jesus shed for us, we are receiving if we do it in faith. Now, I'm not saying that this is, this is uh, in the sense of some traditions, we don't believe that it actually physically turns into the body of Jesus, but spiritually it represents it. And so when we partake of it, it is as if... We are receiving the body of Christ. And it's as if we are receiving anew the blood of Christ. Now, I, I don't want you to think, I don't want you to get confused that this is where you're saved in this particular physical act. It's not. There's no magic in this. It's whether or not you in your heart receive what Jesus has done for you and allow your life to align with his. That's how you know. That's how you know it's real, when your life begins to align with his. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. I want to pause a moment and just say, you realize that when Jesus came, a lot of people didn't understand why he had come. They had some ideas about what the Messiah would do and what the Christ would do and and how he would help them and that kind of thing. And it very, very rarely had anything to do with the fact of our sin. It had more to do with God somehow making life easier for us. God isn't interested in just making your life easier. What he's interested in is making your life holy. 
Now, you can't make your life holy, but in Christ, God can make your life holy. And when your life is surrendered to him, when you receive, when you partake, when you allow that life to come into you, when you turn from your sin and you place your faith in Jesus Christ, he comes in and begins to rearrange things. See, as Lewis talked about how when you receive Christ, it's like letting God into the house, the small little house of your life. And that, of course, as time goes on, he begins to do things. He will do things in your life. He'll move the furniture, so to speak. He'll knock down the walls and enlarge the spaces. And you're wondering, who is this guy who's in my house rearranging everything? And then you remember, this is Jesus, and he has the right. He purchased you through his blood. You know, he has the right to rearrange your life. And it isn't just to make life easier. It's to make you ready for heaven. So... People have these strange ideas, but this is what Paul says in, to the Corinthians. He says, we once regarded him according to the flesh, but now we know better. We know why he came. That's what it means. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new what? Creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. It's not from me. It's not from you. It's not even from the church. It's from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, interesting, he gave us something. Is it presence? Well, sort of. He gave us a calling. What is this calling that he gave to us in verse 18? But the ministry of reconciliation, of connecting what has been torn apart. Through Christ, we're reconciled. We're made one. We're reunited with our Creator. With sin, no longer part of the equation. Forgiven, put away, forgotten. We have died to that old person who used to love to sin, and we are alive to him now, wanting to love him and to know that love and to walk in his ways. Fulfilling the calling that he has given to us, that ministry of reconciliation, and it is our heart's desire to see others also receive the gift we've been given. I hope that's your heart's desire. If you've been made a child of God, if you've been forgiven, if you've been forgiven and made new, I hope it's your heart's desire to see others experience that too. To know that their destiny has changed from hell to heaven. That their sin has not conquered them. That Christ has conquered them and made them alive. Verse 19, all... Um, it says that it is in Christ God reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20 is calling, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. And we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. He took our punishment. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have a, we are a new creation. I don't know that we always unpack 2 Corinthians 5.17 as well as we ought to. But understand this, that what you once were as far as God is concerned, that person died. That person was nailed to the cross along with Jesus. That person was buried. This is why we baptize in Baptist. We baptize by immersion. Because it's a picture of that burial that being put away in that old self. And then what? Being raised to new life. A new creation. Like Jesus rose from the dead. We also spiritually are risen from the dead. Except now with no sin. Now that doesn't mean we don't sin. But we don't have it counting against us. We're growing in our mastery of our, of, of, of our sin. Of, of living a victorious life. We're growing but we're not going to quite get there until we go to heaven. Meanwhile, that forgiveness and that grace of God continue to hold on to us. That new covenant brings with it that new creation. And I find this to be an amazing quality of that new creation. Where I said earlier that, that, uh, that we, we measure our maturity in this way. That we've grown in faith. We've grown in obedience to God. We've grown in worship, faith, obedience, 
and worship. And you know well, I'm sure, 1 Corinthians 13 kind of ties that all up in a nice bow that we call love. Love. We love one another because what? Because he has loved us. We love one another because we, as his children, become the expression of God's love to a lost world. So we can love those who hurt us. We can forgive them. Doesn't mean we um, run to get hurt. No, no. But it's going to happen, isn't it? You're going to get hurt. You're going to find difficult people. One of them's talking right now. And with God's help, you can love them. Because he loved you. I'm sure in your own way, you're a hard person to love. And yet God has loved you. And he'll keep loving you. No statute of limitations on the love of God. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me. He heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. When I think about how this is a testimony to everyone who has placed their faith in Jesus, how he has raised them up out of that pit of destruction, both the pit of our temporal suffering in the sense that I, I'm, I'm, I'm filled with angst, I'm filled with fear, I'm filled with uncertainty, I feel lost and hopeless. Now he and his faithfulness, as we look to him, how he lifts us up, up out of that, but also, also the pit of our eternal destruction. Because that was our destiny. That was my destiny. Apart from Jesus, I would be in hell. But he lifted me up out of that. He gave me a new song. A song of his deliverance. A song of his, of his faithfulness. A song of his greatness and of his love. And that's the song that he gives to you as his child. Praise him. I'd like for us to take a moment and allow God to prepare our hearts as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper together. Father, as we look to you, as we consider, Lord, the greatness of your love for us, Lord, and how you have expressed it in such a beautiful and such a profound and perfect way, Lord. How could anyone doubt your love, Lord, when we consider that Jesus came for us as unlovely as we are? And how he, with great patience, endured to the end, Lord, to the cross even, and allowed hateful people, Lord, like us, to nail him to those rough wooden beams, to mock him, to despise him. And yet he held fast until he breathed his last on our behalf. And as his blood flowed, Lord, how that blood was considered by you, O Father, that perfect atoning sacrifice that would tear away the separation, Lord, between us and you. And give us now the forgiveness that we need. As we trust you, Lord, you give to us, Lord, your warm embrace. You give to us your righteousness, Lord. And while we could not keep the covenant, Lord, we receive the covenant through faith in Jesus, Lord. And as we celebrate that, as we observe it in this time together, Lord, let our hearts consider what these elements mean and how perfectly and profoundly you love us. And so we pray in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. We have these numbers come. Okay. Here in a moment, we will receive the element representing the body of Jesus. 
It's the bread. It's unleavened bread. The leaven, representing our sinfulness and our flesh, this is unleavened bread. Jesus was a sinless sacrifice. It's important to remember that. If he was a sinner, then his sacrifice would be nothing to us. But he was a spotless lamb, the lamb of God. And in him there was no sin. So, when you receive the bread, hold on to it. And we'll pray together and partake of it together. It's very sobering, isn't it, to think that as Jesus shared that moment with his disciples, that he knew exactly what was about to happen. He knew the physical pain that he would endure. He knew the emotional pain of that moment. How he persevered through it. And told them, as often as you partake of this, do so in remembrance of it. We remember. This is, this is how we are forgiven. This is how we are healed. You need this. And I don't mean the physical bread so much as I mean the body of Jesus dying in your place. So Father, we thank you for the bread that is Jesus. We thank you that through faith in him, Lord, and only in faith in him, we can be saved. We thank you that we have this moment together, Lord, to remember, to draw together, and to draw together to you, Lord, in recognizing that Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the law. As we partake this bread, thank you for your provision. Please bless it. As we partake of it, Lord, may we be blessed also. In Jesus' name, thank you. As the juice is passed around, please, when you've received it, please hold on to it. But as you hold it, consider 
that Jesus' blood was not shed for himself. He shed for you. Please remember that the Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no cleansing of sin, no removal of it. In some ways, Christianity, biblical Christianity, is a very messy thing. But it is the blood of Christ that washes our sin away. So we're thankful. We're thankful for the blood of Jesus. As you receive it, hold it and thank you. You hold in your hand a picture, a picture of that new covenant, the promise of God that doesn't require that you keep the covenant because you can, but that you receive the covenant through faith in Jesus. You realize as a Christian that your life is about walking in his forgiveness, walking in his life, walking in his power, walking in grace. Undeserved favor. This blood, it wasn't taken from him. It was given by him. So as you drink, remember that it was his blood that covers your sin. Father, we thank you that in Jesus we have wholeness, we have healing, we have forgiveness. Through his blood, Father, we are made clean. We are made righteous in your eyes, O holy God. We praise you and thank you for our Savior, this wonderful, spotless lamb who died for us, but rose again. Praise God. As we partake of this, Father, refresh, Lord, our sense of, your, of the greatness of your forgiveness. How awesome it is to overcome the greatness of our sin. Thank you that Jesus died 
Thank you that his blood was shed for us. Thank you that we have this moment, Lord, to be renewed in this conviction. We bless you. We pray in Jesus' name. Take care. Would you stand, please? <coughs> have this moment to physically respond in some way if God has moved in your heart and life. <coughs> He's brought to your attention the fact that you have never received personally God's forgiveness. You've never stepped into the new life that Jesus offers you. And to do, do that today. If you're discouraged, if you're anxious about the future, if you're burdened by the past, remember that He is with you. And that His life lived for you, His body broken for you, His blood shed for you, that His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, given to you, is so that you may walk in hope and victory and in power. As we sing, if you need to express a decision of some kind, a release, a surrender, I should say, a surrender to your God. And feel free to do that.
what Jesus does for us. Jesus is the hand of God covering us as his children. He covers us from his wrath. He covers us from the meaningless of, meaninglessness of life. He covers us and protects us from a hopeless future. In him we have life. We have his covering, a covering of righteousness. In him we have, we have a father. Do you have anything you'd like to share before we close? Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May you trust in the love of God your Father through Christ and know that he remembers you, that he saves you, that he will sustain you. He will take you through the valleys and over the mountains. He is an anchor for you in a crazy world. He is your peace. Go into 2024 with a certainty, the assurance that God on his throne remembers you and loves you. And no matter what the future may seem to hold, it holds this. God's perfect fulfillment of every promise that he's declared for you. So go in peace, go in joy, but most of all, go in Jesus. In his name. Amen.